So this was a great study and showed benefit in the overall trial, but also in the two major subgroups of coronary artery disease patients and peripheral artery disease patients, realizing there were a fair number with overlap of the two. As you pointed out, that happens in real life probably more than we realize. Yeah. How have those results impacted your own practice as you both deal with a lot of CAD and PAD? Well, I'll tell you, it, it, um, and it's because that's why smart people like John do these studies. I mean, it, it certainly, if you would have said to me, we're going to study 27,000 patients and add a low dose of the factor 10A inhibitor on top of aspirin and chronic coronary disease, and we're going to show a benefit. I would have said, boy, that's a stretch. <laughs> and not only is it a stretch, gosh, I don't know if I'm going to do that in my patients because, look, it's hard enough to get them to take their aspirin, right? So I would have said, and as a trialist, I would have said, boy, I don't know if that. And then, like, you know, this is why we do science. I was shocked that the trial, not only was it positive, it was positive that the trial was stopped early, which is a rare thing where the DSMB or the sort of safety board says, we're worried that this therapy could help the patients who aren't getting it, so we're stopping the trial because there's a benefit. Uh, that doesn't happen much. So, so then I had to at least go, okay, we should probably look at it carefully because the safety board says it's important. And then not only is it that the stroke or the myocardial infarction and the stroke reduction in these patients with atherosclerosis was fairly significant, almost 50%. So that's something we've patients seen, tell you about, We've never right? seen this in any other yeah, we, we, on, on top of GDMT. We've never, we have not of, had 40 yeah. plus percent reduction in stroke. Absolutely. On top of, you know, the guideline directed stuff, well conducted. You know, we spent the first 20, 30 minutes talking about how do all the right things. We all know how hard it is. But in a trial, they were able to do most of the right stuff, all of it pretty high level, and then got this reduction. So that kind of made me take pause. And then I think the second thing was that I had been, as an interventional cardiologist, a platelet-centric person. I had said, you know, I put the stents in, I, I use one platelet, if one platelet's good, I'm going to use two drugs to stop the platelets. And if people have more disease, I'm going to use two drugs longer until they come up with a third one. I'm going to keep using these two. And I was so, so in that era, I was a bit shocked to say, oh, well, you know, it was a different pathway, maybe affecting thrombin directly with the anticoagulant. At a, the dose really matters and getting the right dose might have this effect. And then that translates to mortality. So, you know, if, 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 I, if I took myself back to, you know, the mid-2010, 12, 15 time when these things were going on, I would not have predicted it. It's affected my practice now as a PAD person in where I see a chronic number of patients with coronary disease that have limb disease, carotid disease. And in those patients, they've had multiple interventions. We're doing anything we can to have to right. not go back in. Right. I've started using more of that therapy because in that patient, I'm thinking I'm not only going to have a cardiovascular benefit, that carotid patient I referenced earlier, I might have a stroke benefit. And we'll see as we get into some other ongoing studies about revascularization. But I think in these chronic patients, it's another thing, especially if they've been a few years out from the MI. So who is it that should pull that trigger? So you're seeing in your specialized clinic that patient with PAD or high-risk CAD, and they've got a bunch of atherosclerosis and high-risk factors. You were saying that you've been influenced by this trial that John led. That's terrific. But what's the primary care physician to do? I mean, it is not necessarily so straightforward to identify that patient, is it? I think it is. I mean, I guess I would say, let, let me, let me, let me um, I call it, and I think you, 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 termed the, 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 you made the term polyvascular, mm -hmm. disease in more than one vascular bed. So I tell people if it's in the heart and the limbs, that's more than one vascular bed, that's a good patient that was in this study, would have got a benefit. If it's in the heart and the carotid, whether we call it peripheral or carotid, that's more than one vascular bed. Now I get a little bit crazy. If it's in the heart and the kidney, that's another vascular bed. You may not feel it, but you see creatinine that's elevated. I'm going to call that polyvascular. We did, you know, a, a good... Uh, in reach uh, and others. Well, uh, uh, Tony uh, Gutierrez, for example, we looked at it in Saver, yeah. and we counted that as a vascular bed, even though it's not, strictly speaking, you know, renal artery stenosis in that case, but the fact that there's microalbuminuria. That vascular bed is also involved. Yeah, I think the I'm kidneys... I'm so glad you said that. Yeah, I think the kidney's often crying for attention, if you will. And the only way the kidney finds attention is by occasionally being read on a lab test. And yeah. so that's when I have to pay attention to it. But I'm sure the nephrologist didn't like that comment. But in general, I think if you think about the kidney as another microvascular bed that demonstrates vascular atherosclerosis with abnormal creatinine. So... And then finally, you know, heart failure in general are patients that have multi-vessel disease and more than one coronary vessel often 
So I think about patients that you would see in your practice. I would start with polyvascular heart, legs, heart, neck, heart, kidney. Mm -hmm. Think about those. No, patients. that's really very practical and useful and, and parallels what was actually seen in the trial in terms of groups that can benefit. Can you speak to some of that work that Sonia Anand and other colleagues of yours have done? Certainly so. I, uh, so Sonia did a lot of work on risk stratification. I actually agree with you, Manash, in saying it's actually very simple because it's a bit harder when you're at the lower end of the risk to know exactly where you're at. But the high-risk patient, it's the no-brainer, the person with polyvascular disease. What Sonia found is also people with single vascular bed disease, so just coronary disease, but with the addition of... Uh, mild or moderate heart failure with the addition of diabetes and with the addition of chronic kidney disease, your, your second va vascular bed menage, those people also achieved large absolute benefits. And then if you don't want to remember any of this, but you just want to count risk factors. We all know that the smoker with hypertension and diabetes who's dyslipidemic, who doesn't exercise and has got poor diet, and it's got a big, high BMI, they're high risk, and none of us have to remember anything. If you count your risk factors, if you've got a half a dozen risk factors, you're super high risk, it's great treatment for you. If you've got one risk factor, this comes back to your cholesterol level, and I'd love to hear your thought about that one, but if you've got one risk factor, your cholesterol's in your boots, and you know, you've had one vascular event in the past, maybe you're not the prime candidate for this treatment. Yeah, I think, yeah, well, since you threw that back at me, you know, I, I think the, the, the tripod analogy you gave is correct. So I think even when the LDL is really low, there is a benefit in a high-risk patient where right, the risk right, is there. Right. Yeah, sure. uh, I'm not talking about uh, low-risk primary prevention, but you know, in a patient at high risk where they've demonstrated risk with multiple ischemic events, the need for multiple revascularization procedures, I think there, it's still good to have antithrombotic therapy on board as a safety mechanism. You know, the late Fred Paschkow actually called it a safety belt. That is, yeah, you want to get the LDL and glucose and blood pressure as low as you safely can without side effects. But once you've done that, there's still going to be plaque rupture. The absolute risk, as you point out before, is much lower if all those other risk factors are controlled, if the time from the ischemic event or revascularization is remote. But it doesn't go to zero. So assuming that the person's at low bleeding risk, I think there's still you know, uh, potential value there. So, you know, my feeling is even when the LDL is low, there's benefit. And it's not just my feeling. Data sets show that as well. In fact, in Compass, even in patients, as you know, that were very well treated with all their risk factors, there was still benefit uh, of the 2.5 of rivaroxaban. So I think these are in the right patients who are at high ischemic risk and low bleeding risk.